Thank you. So let me transfer you immediately to my world with this beautiful New York story. It's about a 100-year-old guy that walks into a life insurance office and wants life insurance. And the clerk looks at him and says, you crazy? We're not giving life insurance to 100 years old. And he said, well, that's not true. My, my mother is insured here. And he said, how old is your mother? So she's 120. And is she OK? He said, yeah, she's fine. So clever clerks, he goes to the boss. And there is a lot of uh, promotion here. And they come back to the elderly gentleman. And they say, you know what? We'll be happy to give you life insurance. In fact, why don't you come on Tuesday? We'll have all the papers ready. And you'll be on your way. And the elderly gentleman says, I'm sorry, but I'm busy on Tuesday. And they look at him and said, old man, what do you have on Tuesday? He says, well, on Tuesday, my grandfather is getting married. <laughs> How old is your grandfather? He said he's 150. He's 150 and he wants to get married? He said he doesn't want to, but his parents put lots <laughs> of pressure. Seriously now. You guys out there, you know, Justin, Matthew, whatever your name is, your, your grandparents are looking at you, and they see a lot of them. If you remind them of them when they were young. But when we're looking at our grandparents, we have a total lack of imagination. We think they're a different creature. They were born like sick and old. <laughs> and, and so what I want to tell you is that we, biologists of aging, are harnessing the science, we are able to move on and make sure that not only we can live longer, but live healthier. So let me tell you, first of all, the problem. The problem is de depicted in, in a graph here. And you know, we scientists have to have at least one graph in a, in a, in a, in a, in a lecture. And this graph depicts the relationship between age-related diseases and their few up there, and aging. And you see all of them are going up. And those diseases are, you know, a cancer in blue and heart uh, attacks in, in, in red, and Alzheimer and diabetes in orange, et cetera. And you see that it's very common for all of them. Aging is the major risk factor. Not only it's a major risk factor, but it's on a log scale, which means when you go from 20, 30 to 80, the risk goes from 1 to 1,000. Now, you know about risks. You know that cholesterol is a risk for heart disease. And you know how much of a risk it is? It's a threefold risk. But when you age, you go from 1 to 1,000, and it's common to all those diseases. So I'm coming to this field, and I'm looking at this graph, and I'm saying, hey, the only way to really make, make an impact is to delay aging. Because if you don't delay aging, you'll just switch one disease for another. And since then, it's actually, we know that it's true. You know, if you walk into the emergency room and have a heart attack, you can get a bypass, you can get a stent into your coronaries. But you know what happens within two years if you don't get another heart attack? You get diabetes or cancer, or Alzheimer, because we just fix the heart. We didn't delay the aging. Now, there is another problem. And this problem, you're going to help me. I'm going to actually ask you this question. Do you think that we humans age at a different rate? Do you think that maybe our uh, biological and chronological age are not the same? So I'm going to, so you think about, think about uh, your parents, your grandparents, think about you know, a 50-year-old guy that you know that maybe looks like he's 40. Think of a 60-year-old guy that maybe looks like 70. Think of those, and if you think, if you think that we humans age at different rates, everybody raise their hands, those who think so, and everybody looks around to see how many of you are thinking that way. Please, if we, if we age at different rates, raise your hands. And look around. So you see? Intuitively, you all think, thank you very much. By the way, I can't see anything. But, <laughs> but I've asked these questions before, and I'm sure that almost 95%, those that have, are, 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 are not asleep, are thinking intuitively <laughs> that, that, we can delay, that we can delay aging. 
that, that, that uh, we, we uh, age at different rates. And so how do we use this knowledge? You know, how do the, we use this knowledge in order to understand how come some people uh, die earlier and how, how some people uh, die later? So one of the approaches that I'm going to talk a bit is to take 100 years old because we assume that 100 years old, their aging has been delayed the most. Okay, so what are we trying to achieve here? The upper bar here that is blue and going to kind of pink and then red represent what's happening now. Actually, it's more of an optimistic picture because life expectancy in the United States is 80 years old and this upper graph shows you until age of 85. But you can see that after age 50, people start getting sick and they get sicker and 10 years of their life, they're spending being sick. So this is now. The centenarians I'm going to talk with you about are healthy, 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 and they have a short period of time when they're sick, and then they die. So maybe we want to achieve that. You know, we might, when I write my grant, I'm not saying I want longevity. I'm saying I just want people to stop being sick. So live your 85 years, but don't be sick. And of course, the worst scenario, the nightmare, that we have as scientists is that we achieve longevity without expanding the health span, okay? So everybody just live longer being sick longer, and we don't want to do that. So let me uh, tell you that we've, uh, we've collected a large number. We have almost 600, 100 years old, or people that were really healthy at age 95, uh, we have their children, we have their families, and we're looking for longevity genes and other factors that can influence their aging. And you see a picture that was taken like 1920s of those four guys that are siblings. They were all born between 1910 to 1920 to two parents in New York. And what's unique about them is each one of them have reached the age of 102 when the young sister that way died at 102, they were shocked, couldn't believe that. The other sister lived to be 110. The brother that's sitting died not long ago at 106. But I want to introduce you to my dear friend Irwin, Irwin Khan that is sitting down there with a, with a rifle. And I want to show you a little clip. And the reason I, show, I want to show you this really clip is for you to understand by the way, this, the, he's 108 years old now. This was taken when he was 105. He's still going to work every day. But the point to make is, if you're healthy at age 105 and life is good, then it's a pretty cool idea and maybe we can imitate it. So let's see Irwin Khan. In this office building on Madison Avenue, New York City, 104-year-old investment advisor Irving Kahn is working hard, as he has since his career on Wall Street began in 1928. He shares his secret to a long and healthy life. To wake up in the morning and have something to look forward to. Irving's curiosity and keen business sense have led him to become a widely respected value investor, a member of the New York Stock Exchange, and chairman of Kahn Brothers, the company he founded more than 30 years ago with two of his sons, including Thomas, who is the president. Irving works five days a week with his 67-year-old son and 29-year-old grandson, Andrew. And how are you going to link the underwriting projects. Playing an integral part in managing over $700 million in assets. This is the Aztec website. And Irving says not working is unthinkable. Well, I would pay you if you took it away from me. I, I try to buy it back. He believes mental challenge is key. The important thing is to keep that brain going, you see. To stay sharp, Irving reads materials online, two financial newspapers daily, and a wide range of nonfiction. I read a lot of science. I read no fiction, no mystery stories, and no sex novels. So that leaves a lot of time for science. And it was Irving's interest in science that led him to participate in the Longevity Genes Project at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, led by researcher Nir Barzilai. 
Nir and his team have recruited more than 500 healthy elderly, ages 95 to 112, and their children. Irving and Thomas are part of the study, as is Irving's big sister. Yeah, 108-year-old Helen Reichert, a former television host and fashion historian. So far, Nir and his team have found several gene variants that are more common in this group and protect against cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and Alzheimer's. Erwin uh, has the CTP genotype that seems to be protective against several age-related diseases, including uh, cognitive decline. Nier's team has also found that some genes seem to protect against the effects of certain lifestyle habits. Irving, for instance, used to smoke, but quit to set an example for his children. And Helen smoked for more than 80 years. You can see both from him and his sister that those genes have real amazing effect, not only on the fact that they're alive, but considering the fact that they were smoking and this should have shortened their lifespan immensely. And Irving believes long life has its benefits when it comes to business. Because part of it is some of the advantages that you have when you're older. and You know what's rotten and what's fresh and what's good and what's bad, and you can participate on a bit a higher level. Just, just to make clear, he was talking about reading sex novels, okay? <laughs> so something very interesting about those people, this shows the um, cost of the last two years of life of somebody who dies at age 100 versus somebody who dies at age 70. And it's third the cost, okay? It's because they live longer and they're sick. They're, they have a big health span, but they're sick shorter time. This has been consistent since 1993. This, this data is, is, is closely monitored. Uh, we call it the longevity dividend. If you calculate it, if we could be like that, it would save trillions of dollars. Okay, and, and maybe that's a motivation to start thinking about it. Of course, there's social security, there's a retirement age, there's a whole other issues, but there's a huge longevity dividend. Now, you might come and tell me, just a minute, you know, you're talking about longevity genes and things like that, but maybe it's their interaction with the environment. Maybe what's unique about those guys, they have done what the doctors told us, tells us to do. Maybe they were, uh, eating healthy, they were thin, they were exercising, they were vegetarian maybe, they were drinking one cup of wine, they're of course not smoking. Well, this is what happens. Almost 50% of them were overweight or obese during their lifetime. In fact, 20% of them are overweight or obese when they are centenarians. 60% of the men and 30% of the men were smoking. You saw from Helen, if you smoke for 80 years, you do live long, long life. Uh, exercise, now let's talk about just moderate exercise, like bicycling, housework, uh, you know, things like that, uh, less than 50% of them. Vegetarians, anybody's interested in, in being vegetarian, only 2% of the centenarians are vegetarians. And the point here is for them, okay, not for us, it didn't matter. And I want to show you the really uh, disaster that happens to scientists. We published this paper, and the first to read it was Jay Leno. Let's see what he was thinking about it. I wanted to do a study at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. I don't know where that is, but that's, that's what it says. They say the secret to a long life may actually be more drinking, partying, and less exercise. <laughs> and the good thing about this combination is, if you don't live longer, you don't care. Really, you don't care. Okay, so, so, you know, when, when that comes up, you're just worried that everybody's going to leave their habits and try, you know, to do what they shouldn't do. So, please understand, it's those very unique people like Irving Khan that for them it doesn't matter. For the rest of us, it matters. So, what are we finding? So, let me tell you um, a little bit. First of all, in nature, there's something really interesting. The, the little dogs live longer. The ponies 
live longer than the, the horse. Dwarfs in nature seems to live longer. So one of the things we're looking for is what happens in those growth hormones. And let me tell you that the growth hormones and other genes, not only growth hormone genes, have been manipulated in many, many animals, in the worms, in fruit flies, in mice, in rats, even in monkeys. And we can extend not only lifespan, but healthy lifespan in variety of models by manipulating sometimes single genes or using drugs or using certain nutrients, we can modulate lifespan all over. So this is something that we've done again and again and again, and it's very possible to do. In centenarians, Dr. Milman from Einstein have shown that when you take those 100 years old and you ask what predicts their mortality, the answer was the people with the lowest growth hormone level have lived twice as long. Okay, they were already centenarians, but they live twice as long than those who have higher growth hormone level. Another scientist from Einstein, Dr. Su, have shown that there are functional mutations in the growth hormone genes in clusters. And, and those people who have those mutations, by the way, are an inch shorter, not dwarf, but they're an inch shorter. But there are other mutations in genes that are associated with longevity that have nothing to do with growth hormone uh, either. But all those have been shown from animals to centenarians. So imagine, we are, we are at the entrance of the promised land, okay? We know how to increase health span and lifespan in variety of models. More than that, there are drugs that are being developed by pharmaceuticals, some of them based on our research, but they're not developed for aging, but for specific diseases. Together with Dr. Hassi Cohen in USC, we have a company that has a novel technology to replace proteins that are being decreased in the plasma. So those stories are everywhere. Also, there are drugs that are currently in human use, not for aging reasons, for other reasons, that have shown to prevent variety of diseases, uh, but they're not being prescribed now against aging. And by the way, those, this is the 20 minute talk. In the second date, I can talk more about the drugs out there that you could, that you could use. But, but with, all that, with all that knowledge, what's hard to imagine is one thing. The FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, doesn't consider aging as something that can be prevented. And as long as that happens, you know, the, 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 your insurance company is not going to pay your bill if you take a drug. And the pharmaceuticals are not going to develop the drugs because if nobody is going to pay for their use, why would they spend the money on that? So again, imagine we are at a stage where scientists have done all they can to do the preclinical pre studies and to show and demonstrate again and again that healthy lifespan can be extended. And we need you to be aware of that and help us demand it so that your aging will be just beautiful. Thank you so much.